Today we have Jonathan Grossman speaking on course geometric coherence and co-limits of coarsely coherent groups. Hello, thank everyone who is here for coming and listening and watching. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about course geometric coherence and co-limits of coarsely coherent groups. Uh, I'm currently at Merrimack College, but when I was studying the subject, I was at the University of Albany, SUNY. Uh, this research was joint work with Boris Goldbarb and uh, was originally initiated uh, while I was a doctoral student uh, and then immediately afterward while I was still at the University of Albany. It wasn't part of my dissertation project. It didn't make it into the document, but it is a continuation of what I was working on in that time, uh, namely the course invariant course geometric coherence. Um, course geometric coherence is a property of groups and metric spaces that in combination with the Novikov conjecture yields the Borel conjecture regarding the rigidity of aspherical manifolds and algebraic K-theory. Um, the original Borel conjecture uh, stated that two aspherical manifolds with isomorphic fundamental groups are homeomorphic, and the K-theoretic analog of that uh, is about the existence of an assembly map that is an isomorphism between uh, homology groups and K theories of group rings, but I'm not going to dive into the K theory today. I'm going to stay in the realm of course geometry and geometric topology. Uh, I'm also not going to veer down the road of category theory, though uh, that certainly is underlying a lot of this work. I'm going to stick with the course geometry for today. So I'm going to start with what is a more visual, intuitive kind of introduction to what course geometry is, and then we'll get more technical and specific as we go, um, in particular as we start talking about course geometry of finitely generated groups in particular, and then co-limits of groups. Uh, by the time we reach the definition of course geometric coherence, that uh, must be defined very explicitly in the language of what I'll introduce as filtered modules. Uh, and then we'll get to our result regarding co-limits of coarsely coherent groups. So let's talk a little about coarse geometry. Uh, so coarse geometry is the study of metric spaces as though from a great distance. Very hand wavy visual introduction. Uh, this large scale perspective of metric spaces is one in which we judge two spaces to be equivalent if they look the same from far away. That's how I'm going to phrase that. We're going to get to the technical definition of course equivalence a little later on, but I just want to start out with the broad strokes here. So for example, if you are thinking about uh, a tall building, as you move further and further away from it, shrinks closer and closer to a point on the horizon, that's the kind of large scale uh, behavior that I'm talking about here. If we're talking about metric geometry, any bounded metric space from far enough away, you can imagine will shrink to a point or any curve, no matter how bumpy, like our sine curve here, as you move further and further away, will kind of flatten out uh, to form a line. That's the kind of behavior I'm interested in. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in studying course invariants and their properties. Uh, but since the one that I would like to talk to you about today, uh, course coherence, must be defined so Technically, I thought I would begin with a little bit about probably the most elementary of those, uh, which is asymptotic dimension. So this looks a little bit technical because I start introducing variables and inequalities, but this is still very hand wavy. This is by no means the, def the strict uh, rigorous definition of what asymptotic dimension is. But you can imagine if there exists some big N greater than zero, so that for all little n greater than that big N, the apparent dimension of a metric space viewed from that distance is always less than some fixed non-negative integer d. Uh, then we say the metric space has asymptotic dimension less than or equal to d. If there is no such d, so no matter how far away you get from your metric space, it still seems to be unbounded in all dimensions. Uh, we say that that metric space has infinite asymptotic dimension, but if there is such a number d, so that from far enough away you see some finite dimensional thing, uh, we say that your metric space has finite asymptotic dimension and the least such integer 
uh, satisfying the asymptotic dimension inequality is said to be that specific asymptotic dimension. Generally speaking, and practically speaking in the field, we're not usually concerned with what the specific uh, number D is. We care whether a metric space is finite asymptotic dimensional or not, but not whether that dimension is two or three or seven. Uh, so we won't worry too much about what that number D is in life, but I did want to give uh, some examples that harken back to the ones you just saw. So uh, thinking about those bounded metric spaces, all of those have asymptotic dimension zero because as you get further and further away and they shrink to a point, points have dimension zero. And similarly, our curves from calc one, like our sine curve, uh, which appear to conform to the shape of a line, right, a one dimensional space, uh, all of those have asymptotic dimension one, for example. Uh, asymptotic dimension is a coarse invariant in the following sense. If we have two spaces M and N that look the same from far away, right, they're coarsely equivalent, and again, I'll give the more technical definition of what that means in a moment, uh, and we know the asymptotic dimension of one of those spaces, the other space has that same asymptotic dimension. So being coarsely equivalent means that this property is preserved, that it's an invariant of those spaces, that's what we mean by coarse invariant. And thinking about our examples thus far, uh, all of our bounded metric spaces are coarsely equivalent because as we get further away, right, they all shrink to a point, and we know that points have dimension zero. So all of these, uh, you would only need to know the dimension of the asymptotic dimension of one of these spaces to know that all of them have asymptotic dimension zero because they all look the same from far away. That's what we value our coarse invariance for. And then I just wanted to make a note here so that uh, one does not fall into the trap of thinking that having asymptotic dimension zero and being bounded are equivalent. Uh, it's not an if and only if statement. Uh, there are unbounded metric spaces of asymptotic dimension zero, and I include one here. So if you think of the powers of two on the real number line, uh, as you step further and further back or zoom out further and further, there is some kind of clustering at the lower powers of two, but this space is unbounded. They'll always be further and further away, uh, powers of two. It will never all cluster down to one point. So we have this unbounded space, but each of these uh, points still outside of our little clustering area are still points, are still things that have a parent or visual dimension zero. So this is an asymptotic dimension zero space that is unbounded. So just to make it clear that it's not asymptotic dimension zero, if and only if bounded, that there's more going on here than that. Is, is this equivalence weaker than quasi-isometry? Yes. Quasi-isometries are specific and narrower uh, coarse equivalences. You'll actually see that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, so for finitely generated groups, which is what I'm interested in looking at, or at least the, the jumping off point for that, uh, I fully expect everyone to know uh, what it means for a group to be finitely generated, but I'm telling you anyway. Uh, a group is finitely generated if every element is a product of finitely many elements, or elements from a finite set, sorry, uh, S and G, and we say that S is symmetric if any element little s in big S implies that little s inverse is also in big S. Similarly, a graph is comprised of a vertex set and an edge set, and then uh, the Cayley graph, which is the kind of graph that I like to play with, uh, of a finitely generated set G is a graph whose vertices are the elements of that group and whose vertices are connected by an edge uh, whenever you move by, uh, or rather you get from one to the other by multiplication with an element from that finite generating set. And another way to say that is to say that G inverse H is in that finite generating set S. And I have a couple of examples here of Cayley graphs. So if you think of the integers with the usual uh, generating set plus or minus one, we just get our usual number line, nothing exciting happening there. Uh, similarly, the Cayley graph for Z6, Z mod six, uh, again, standard generating set plus or minus one uh, is just this hexagon shape. And these are the two examples I'm going to use later on, which is why I include them now. Uh, but they're nice, friendly examples of what a Cayley graph is and what they look like. I also 
am totally confident that you guys are comfortable with uh, metrics and metric spaces, but just to have everything out there, right? A metric space is a set and a metric function that's uh, you know non-negative, zero if and only if you're measuring the distance from a point to itself. Symmetric obeys the triangle inequality. Uh, the metric we're going to use throughout this talk is the word metric on our Cayley graphs, uh, where the distance between any two elements of our group, any two vertices on our Cayley graph, is the length of uh, the shortest word, not necessarily unique, between uh, the inverse of the first point and the uh, second point. When we're going from G to H, the length of G inverse H. In terms of those generators from our finite symmetric generating set S. So going back to our examples, if we're talking about the integers with the usual generating set, that's just our Euclidean norm, subtraction, nothing exciting happens there. Uh, when we're talking about Z mod six, the distance between any two points is just the length of the shortest path between them. That path is not necessarily unique, but there is a shortest one, uh, not necessarily unique, but a length. And now we get to that technical definition that uh, when you look at it should definitely bring into relief that these are just a more general version of a quasi isometry. So uh, course embedding, phi from x to y is a function between metric spaces, x and y, such that there exists two non-decreasing control functions. So for quasi isometries, those are linear, but uh, we're saying these don't have to be, they just have to be non-decreasing. Uh, from the non-negative reals to the non-negative reals, satisfying that uh, we say, or I say, uh, row minus and row plus. Some folks say row lower and row upper. Some use row and delta instead of two rows. Uh, your favorite letters aside, uh, but that the limit as t approaches infinity of row minus of t is infinity. So this uh, bottom bound that we see in this inequality here does eventually have to grow off toward infinity. Uh, but such that the distance between the images of any pair of points from our domain is in some way bounded or controlled uh, by a function on the distance that the points originally were from one another in the domain. So we have this idea that wherever any pair of points are sent, they can't be too much closer or too much further away than they originally were from one another. Uh, map phi is coarsely onto if there is some number c, so that for all elements of the codomain, there's an element of the domain whose image is within C of that point in the codomain. And if you have those two things together, a course embedding that is coarsely onto, that uh, map is called a course equivalence, and the two metric spaces are said to be coarsely equivalent. So this is the technical rigorous definition that I promised you of what it meant for two spaces to look the same from far away. And I have just a really elementary example here uh, that the inclusion of the integers into the real numbers is a course equivalence. Uh, clearly, the distance is controlled. The distance between any two integers is the same, whether you're viewing them in the integers or in the real numbers. Uh, so the control functions are just the identity. Uh, and certainly, any real number is within distance 1 half of an integer. So that map is coarsely onto as well. So let's move on to one of the two uh, meteor sections of the talk. We're going to talk about co-limits. Not going to bring the category theory into it, though clearly that underpins the notion of what a co-limit is. Um, and then we'll get to uh, coarse geometric coherence and uh, co-limits of coarsely coherent groups. All right. So again, avoiding the category theory here, uh, I'm specifically interested in looking at ascending chains of finitely generated groups uh, that look like this. So, you know, G0 is a subgroup of G1, is a subgroup of G2, etc. cetera. Uh, and we take the union of those nested groups and we call that the co-limit of the family. And if you want your morphisms for your category theory, our maps are the inclusions of the G sub I into the G sub J for all I less than or equal to J. So, uh, nice introductory example here. If we just take some uh, powers of two, those multiples of z, uh, hopefully everyone's comfortable saying that those are all kind of nested. Uh, 
And certainly any chain like this that stabilizes, where after a certain point, after a certain G sub K, all of the uh, G sub I are the same, uh, it's clear that that co-limit is then just going to be whatever your group stabilized at, in this case, the integers, uh, but what have you. Uh, so my motivating example here is going to do with products or direct sums of the integers because that's what motivated me to do what you'll ultimately see. So uh, consider Z as being generated by a symmetric generating set. I switched from ones to E's because we're going to be ultimately using letters uh, gamma and sigma really later on. So I just wanted to kind of transition away from uh, the plus one minus one notation. Uh, if we think of Z is generated by plus or minus E, Z2 is generated by uh, a copy of the plus or minus E from the first copy of Z and then from the second. Similarly, Z to the N, N copies of these generators, right? And we can construct an ascending chain just nesting each of these uh, products of Z with itself appropriately. And we're going to call the co-limit, right, the union of all these up through infinity, Z infinity. Uh, and the obvious choice for a generating set for Z infinity is the infinite one, right? The one we're used to seeing maybe in an analysis course instead, uh, where we have all of the um, copies of the plus or minus E's, those symmetric generators, uh, indexed over the natural numbers, with the only requirement being that those generators have to commute with one another. Uh, but that's not finite, and that doesn't work for me uh, for two reasons. First, because our Cayley graphs require we have a finite symmetric generating set, and I don't have that anymore. Uh, and second, that uh, most of the course invariants that I'm interested in studying, and in general, uh, are at least initially stated for finitely generated groups. And then we use this notion of course equivalence to say that, uh, well, if your metric space comes from a group that isn't finitely generated or is a lot messier than the ones we've talked about, but it is coarsely equivalent to one that is finitely generated and behaves nicely, as long as that finitely generated one has your course invariant, we'll say that the messy one has it as well. So most of our course invariants are stated in terms of finitely generated groups with the understanding that uh, messier groups that are coarsely equivalent to that nice finitely generated one are also assumed to have that property. Uh, so having Z infinity not be finitely generated, at least this particular uh, set of generators, meant that I couldn't use my Cayley graph and I couldn't yet use uh, any kind of statement about course equivalence. Uh, so I had to figure something out, right? And I will tell you what I figured out, but first I have to describe for you what course geometric coherence is, and it's going to look totally different from everything else we've seen so far. Uh, course geometric coherence is expressed in the language of filtered modules, which doesn't look like course geometry on the face of it. So that's going to take a little bit of explaining. And if it was something you would be interested in, it would take a little bit of living with and playing with uh, before you got comfortable with, or at least that's how it was for me. So I need to tell you what a filtered module is in this setting. So consider a metric space X, generally a Cayley graph of a finitely generated group, symmetric generating set, the kind we've been talking about, we say that in our module M is X filtered if to each subset of that metric space is associated a submodule. Uh, we use the notation M parentheses of your subspace, M of S, uh, so that the following uh, conventions are met. So the empty uh, subset of your metric space needs to be set to the zero submodule. Uh, the submodule associated to the whole metric space needs to be the whole module and inclusion needs to be respected. So if S is a subset of T in your metric space, then the submodule of M associated to S needs to be a submodule of the module, submodule of M associated to T. All right, so we have uh, rules that require this filtration be nice in kind of this very uh, specific way that should look familiar from other notions of like basis and niceness from topology. So I have a couple of examples just so you can kind of get an idea of what I mean here. Uh, so the basis of the study of this subject is from manifold topology, and when we're talking about manifold topology, usually the ring that comes into play is the ring of integers. So uh, 
while these results are applicable more broadly, right now we're just going to care about the ring of integers and we're going to let our metric space be that Cayley graph of z sub 6 that I drew for you before, the hexagon. And we're going to look at two filtered modules. Uh, first, the z module, the integers themselves. Uh, one filtration could be sending 0 in uh, z mod 6 to the 0 module, sending 3 to the even multiples in z, sending 1 and 5 to the whole module, the integers themselves, and sending 2 and 4 to the multiples of 3. Uh, and then saying for any other subset of your metric space, say, you know, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 4, 5, or I don't know, 2, 3, uh, just take the greatest common divisor of those elements and send that set to the submodule associated to whatever the greatest common divisor is. Uh, so that would work here. Another uh, filtered module looks a little bit different would be the direct sum of Z mod 2 with itself. Uh, then we could send 0 to 0, comma 0. We could send uh, 3 to the right-hand copy of Z mod 2. We could send 2 and 4 to the left-hand copy of Z mod 2. And we can send 1 and 5 again to the whole module. Uh, there's kind of a pattern for the nice filtrations of Z mod 6 that you can see here, uh, but not all filtrations look like this. Uh, and then again, you can say for any arbitrary subset of Z mod 6, find the greatest common divisor of those elements in the usual sense and send uh, that set to the submodule associated to wherever that greatest common divisor gets sent. So hopefully these are some friendly filtrations. It should be clear why these would be good choices for uh, subgroups of Z and all that good stuff. And then here's where things get messy, because now that we have these creatures, these filtered modules, we're going to start defining conditions on them that indicate what it means for a filtration to be nice in particular ways, and what it means for a module homomorphism to respect a filtration. Uh, so we'll start with the latter of those. We'll start with what it means for a module homomorphism to kind of respect a filtration on a module. So if we have a module homomorphism D from M to N between X filtered R modules, we say that it's bi-controlled, uh, which is our word for respecting the filtrations, if there is some number little b greater than or equal to zero, so that for any subset of your metric space, the image of the submodule associated to that set is contained in the submodule associated to the B enlargement of that set in the domain. So what this bracket what, what was the role of so I just forgot, what was the role of X again? And what was X the role of M and N? So we want to turn our metric space and our metric geometry, turn that into algebra so we can play with the algebra instead. And that's what filtering the modules this way is supposed to do. Was, was X, I'm just having trouble remembering, was uh, from the previous slide, was X the, the Z mod 6? X was the Cayley graph of Z mod 6. Oh, the, it's the Cayley graph of Z mod 6, OK. And, uh, and M is like some functor that takes uh, like some uh, subset of, it, it takes in a subset of the Cayley graph? Yes. And it outputs uh, a module, but since there's category theory under all of this, M is also a functor. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but so what's the, the input of it is a sub, is a sub uh, module, is it, sorry, is the, input, the input of it is a subset of the Cayley graph or? Yes. Okay. It takes a subset of your metric space, a subset of the Cayley graph, and uh, associates with it a submodule of a module. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and like M was like, and it it associates a submodule of M. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. No problem. Uh, so instead of writing, you know, metric balls or what have you for neighborhoods, we're using this bracket notation. So S with the brackets B is the metric ball of radius b about the set s. So the submodule of m associated to s is uh, has image in the submodule of n associated to an enlargement of s. So the idea being that uh, when you have this module homomorphism uh, evaluated at a submodule associated to a particular subset of your metric space, the module that that is sent to, the submodule that that is sent to, can't vary so far from 
uh, the submodule associated to that set from your metric space that you're interested in. So that's uh, respecting our filtration in one way and going the other way. If you look at the submodule of the codomain associated to S intersected with the image of your domain, uh, that also has to be contained in the image of uh, the submodule of your domain associated to that metric enlargement. So going in either direction, either starting with the submodule in your domain or in your codomain, uh, it can't stray too far from an associated submodule in whichever the other one is. If you start with your domain, your co uh, its image in the codomain has to stay kind of near, be near in uh, in a sense to that module and similarly going the other way. What is S of B? Uh, the metric enlargement of S by B in your metric space. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it's the neighborhood of, or the ball of radius B about okay. whatever. Okay. Okay. When you say ball, you mean open ball or closed ball, or, or it doesn't matter here? Closed ball. Closed ball, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking of in practical applications, it doesn't, the distinction isn't made because it's not important, but uh, I'm going to say, because it's easier for right now, that the closed ball is the way to go. Um, so that's what it means for a module homomorphism to respect our filtration. And then here are some conditions we can place on the filtered modules themselves. Uh, the first two are of the same flavor. One is just a relaxation of the other. And then the last one is a little bit different, but I'm going to talk to you about all of them. So if you have an X-filtered R module M, uh, that module is lean. If it is the case that whenever you take a subset of your metric space, the submodule of M associated to that subset can be written as a sum of submodules associated to the neighborhoods of the elements of that subset. So in some sense, you can take your larger submodule and break it up into a bunch of smaller pieces, which is what the image on the right is kind of supposed to suggest, that you have the set S, but if you take neighborhoods of all of the points of S, the submodules associated to those kind of cover the original S you started with. And then to be scattered is to say, that's not necessarily something we know for an arbitrary subset of X, but at least we know we can write the whole module that way, that the whole module can always be written as a sum of submodules, each of which is associated to the individual points of your metric space. And then to be insular is not about breaking up your metric space, but is about kind of intersections behaving nicely. So if you have the submodule of M associated to S and the submodule of M associated to T, and you intersect those, you would like it to be the case that the submodule, that that intersection is contained in a submodule related to the intersection of S and T, right? That intersections are respected. And the way that that happens here is we have that the submodule of the intersection, sorry, the submodule associated to the intersection of S and T is contained in the submodule of M associated to the submodule of S enlarged a little bit by this uh, little d intersected with uh, T enlarged by D. So I needed two rows to kind of make that clear here. But if you have S and T and you look at their intersection, uh, the submodule associated to the intersection of S and of T will be contained in the submodule associated to the enlargement of that intersection. This is kind of a leading picture. The picture can look a little bit different and you have to grapple with that. But this was I would have to draw a lot of other pictures <laughs> to kind of cover all of the cases here. This is this is a, a nice uh, situation. So, so what's the relation? Is uh, being lean uh, stronger than being scattered? Yes. Uh, is there any relation between lean scattered and insular? You're about to see one. Oh, okay, thanks. No problem. Yeah. Uh, but first, just returning to our example, so you can see in the most boring, trivial sense possible for talking about filtered modules, but it's still instructive. If we go back to our example of the Cayley graph of Z mod 6 uh, with the filtration that I mentioned before, so I won't go through it again, uh, Z mod 6 has this nice and boring property that uh, it's bounded by 3. So if you take any element in the Cayley graph of Z mod 6, uh, if you go 3 in either direction, right? ultimately you can traverse all of the elements of Z mod 6. So since we have this tiny space, uh, we can actually argue that 
the R filtration is lean and insular. And since, as we mentioned, lean is a stronger condition than scattered, we know that if that uh, submodule, that if the module is lean, then it's also scattered. So I'm not going to mention that explicitly. Uh, but let S and T be some non-empty. I did say it here, but non-empty uh, subsets of our metric space X. Certainly, if we look at the submodule of M associated to S, and pick an arbitrary element in S, call it little X. If we enlarge X by three we get the whole metric space, and we know that the submodule associated to the whole metric space is the whole module. So the submodule of M associated to S is certainly contained in the whole module, and that is certainly contained in the sum of a bunch of copies of the whole module. So leanness, very straightforward here. And similarly for insularity, if you take the intersection of two submodules, uh, both of which uh, their kind of corresponding subsets S and T, uh, are not empty. S enlarged by three will be our whole Cayley graph again. T enlarged by three will be our whole Cayley graph. Their intersection is the whole Cayley graph. The module associated to that intersection is the whole module. And certainly any intersection of submodules is contained in the original module. So not very exciting, but does demonstrate that uh, this filtration is an insular one. And if you would like an example of a module homomorphism that is bi-controlled, right, that respects our filtration, uh, recall the filtration we had for Z mod 2 uh, plus Z mod 2 and send uh, all even integers to 0, 0 and odd integers to 1, 1. And I'll leave it as a uh, exercise for the watcher or the reader uh, to show that that's a bi-controlled homomorphism. And it relies on the same boring fact that x is bounded by 3. So you'll take b for the bi-controlled statement to be 3, and everything falls out in the same way it did for lean or insular. So this is going to be how we relate uh, leanness, insularity, and scatteredness. So x is coarsely coherent, the property we've all been waiting for. If uh, for any short exact sequence of x filtered R modules where the middle term is lean, the last term is insular, and the two uh, module homomorphisms are bi-controlled, they respect the filtrations, then it necessarily follows that the first term was scattered. This is actually the uh, reverse statement there's a theorem of five statements stating, you know, if the first two terms are lean, then the last one must be lean. And if the last two terms are insular, then the first one must be insular. And kind of those kind of statements. And the only one that isn't true a priori is this one, uh, that if the middle term is lean and the last is insular, then the first must be scattered. Uh, so that's part of why, uh, that's part of kind of the founding of this course invariant is that we knew a bunch of other statements about short exact sequences of this form were true based on which ones you insist be lean or insular and those kind of results. Uh, but this one is not necessarily true. You have to do work and there are relevant meaningful consequences toward that uh, Borel conjecture that I mentioned uh, when it is the case. And so that's kind of the way I got interested in this property. Uh, the notation in the literature for this uh, we use the this gothic C to denote coarse coherence, and we say X is in this gothic C to indicate that X is a coarsely coherent metric space. And since uh, I, I think it is safe to assume you've not spent uh, much time thinking in the language of filtered modules in this way, uh, just so that you can get a little bit familiar or realize that spaces and groups that you're familiar with do actually have this property, uh, certainly any bounded metric space is coarsely coherent. The argument for the Cayley graph of Z6 uh, works for any bounded metric space, replacing three with whatever the bound on your metric space is. Uh, the integers and the real numbers are both coarsely coherent, as are the higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. Spaces with finite asymptotic dimension, that coarse invariant I introduced earlier, those are all coarsely coherent. And if you are a little familiar with coarse geometry and you know what straight finite decomposition complexity is, spaces with straight finite decomposition complexity are coarsely coherent. Uh, and if you don't know, straight finite decomposition complexity spaces are a pretty broad class of groups and metric spaces. So it does kind of indicate that this isn't uh, quite 
an obscure or un, ungrounded, unfounded uh, thing to investigate, that it does actually describe a lot of spaces and groups with which uh, we work with regularly. So let's get to the result. We want to talk about co-limits of these coarsely coherent groups. So in order to state the result, you need to know what it means for metric spaces to be coarsely coherent as a family. Uh, so we have our family of metric spaces, the X sub alpha, and we have an arbitrary, you know, any family of short exact sequences of the kind we saw in the definition, uh, such that the middle term is lean, the last term is insular, the two maps are bi-controlled, they respect the module homomorphism, uh, where the constants involved are fixed for the whole family and associated short exact sequences. Uh, if in that case, it still always follows that the first term must then be scattered for again some common constant uh, for all of the E prime sub alphas, then we say that the family is coarsely coherent as a family. This is a different statement than saying you have a bunch of metric spaces that are coarsely coherent and you make a family out of them. This is stronger. It's saying that not only do each of the individual members of this family need to be coarsely coherent, but they need to be coarsely coherent in this uniform way where all of the constants match for each of them. If you have a family of groups that's coarsely coherent as a family uh, that form one of those ascending chains, like I mentioned before, then the co-limit G is coarsely coherent. That's the big result of what came out of this. So that's, that's really where I was headed here. And it's because I was interested in looking at Z infinity. Uh, and this kind of fell out of trying to get at that, as did the following. So in order to say what I wanted to say about Z infinity, I needed to uh, actually delve into wreath products. And then in order to uh, get the statement I wanted about wreath products, I needed to work with those co-limits. This all kind of fell together that way. So recall that uh, restricted wreath product of finitely generated groups, G and H, is the semi-direct product, or one of the ways you can characterize it is as the semi-direct product of G of copies of G indexed over the elements of H, uh, semi-direct product with H. Uh, and you can think of that wreath product as generated by the generating set of G union the generating set of H. Uh, and therefore, the wreath product is finitely generated with respect to this generating set. And I want to distinguish this metric from the one that we saw before for Z infinity, that infinite generating set. So when I'm talking about the word metric associated to this generating set, uh, I call it the wreath metric. And I denote it with D subscript that wreath symbol, wreath product symbol as opposed to the kind of canonical Euclidean uh, Z infinity infinite generating set. Uh, and the example I was interested in, if we think of the wreath product of Z with itself as being generated with the usual generating sets for each copy of Z, uh, which could be a little confusing, plus or minus one and plus or minus one. So I say let gamma denote the generator from the first copy of Z and sigma denote the generator from the second copy of Z. Regardless of how kind of involved, and it's not messy, it's very orderly. It's like this kind of twisted lattice thing, but um, certainly difficult to visualize this wreath product. Uh, but if you write these terms, uh, gamma to the k, sigma, gamma to the k, to the inverse, okay, uh, you actually get your copies of z to the n out of our uh, reef, and we can all of a sudden talk about the sets that I was interested in, z to the n, z infinity, as uh, subgroups of this reef product now with a finite generating set, which brings me back to what I was interested in uh, from the beginning when I said that z infinity is great, this way of thinking of it as a co-limit is great, but it's not finitely generated anymore, so I can't play with the Cayley graph and I can't use my course invariance, and darn, does that make me sad. Uh, but now I can think of Z infinity as a subgroup of this finitely generated restricted wreath product, and I get to use all of those tools now. 
So I wasn't actually interested in the wreath product when I started. I wasn't particularly interested in co-limits when I started. I was interested in Z-infinity, but that's the way that math research happens. I went on a wild ride and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. So I initiated this investigation into co-limits of coarsely coherent groups uh, because I was interested in arguing that Z-infinity is coarsely coherent. That's kind of a stepping stone on this path that I'm on. Uh, however, the tools that I wanted to use, talking about Cayley graphs, talking about some other geometric group theory machinery, talking about course invariance, talking about something that I didn't really mention today, uh, which are permanence properties of course invariance and all of that kind of uh, technical stuff, just can't be applied to Z-infinity in the way I wanted to be able to apply it with the usual kind of Euclidean version of the word metric and all of that and the usual generating set. So my strategy was find a finitely generated group of which the infinity is a subgroup, uh, prove some things about that, and then use that thing that I didn't mention, uh, permanence properties, uh, to say that, well, any subgroup of a finitely generated coarsely coherent group is also coarsely coherent, which again, that's, that was part of my dissertation project. Uh, along with several other uh, statements of that nature. Uh, permanence property is a statement about the inheritance of your course invariant. So things like the product of two spaces that have a course invariant will also have that course invariant, those kind of inheritance statements. Um, course coherence has one of those for subgroups. So any subgroup of a coarsely coherent group is coarsely coherent, no matter how messy that subgroup is, uh, which is pretty nice if you think about things like um, the subgroups of finitely generated groups not necessarily being finitely generated. Uh, course coherence kind of has something on that finite generated this property. Uh, but in any case, I needed to find a finitely generated group that had the group I wanted as a subgroup and that I could actually apply my machinery to and show that it was coarsely coherent and get the result that I wanted. So that's how I ended up on this path, uh, studying these brief products a little bit. And that actually ended up being valuable in and of itself when I was studying geometric group theory, working up toward my dissertation project, I looked at things like the lamp lighter groups, which I thought were really cool at the time, and those are wreath products. So I learned that the lamp lighter groups are coarsely coherent, which was just like a nice, uh, sweet touch at the end for me. Uh, and I also got this kind of cool converse result. So I know because of that permanence property that any subgroup of a coarsely coherent group is coarsely coherent. I didn't know if it could go the other way. I did not know if every finitely generated subgroup of a group is coarsely coherent. Would that imply that the original group of which those subgroups uh, belong would be coarsely coherent? But it turns out if every finitely generated group, if that family of finitely generated subgroups of your group is coarsely coherent as a family, the original group must also have been coarsely coherent. So I also got this uh, nice going the other way result. So I have this if and only if now that uh, group is coarsely coherent, if and only if all of its finitely generated subgroups are coarsely coherent as a family that I didn't. What was, uh, what was the theorem for groups again? Um, the theorem for groups was that if you had an, uh, one of those ascending chains where all of the members were coarsely coherent as a family that the co-limit must be coarsely coherent. So okay. that's the main result that I had. Okay. And as a corollary of that, I have this statement, which is. Uh, can, can I ask also a question? So, so in order to, to say what uh, some group is coarsely coherent, you, you need to associate to some metric space to your group. Yes. Uh, and uh, for point to generate, you can take uh, your Kelly graph and uh, it's, um, it's not, not, it's not so important which generation set you, you're choosing where. Yeah, so if I am saying that a group has this property, what I really mean is the Cayley graph of that group has yes, this. Yes, but, but for not finitely generated group, uh, is it still true what uh, Cayley graph uh, does, does not depend uh, uh, on, on your choice of a, of a generating set? Uh, so for not finitely generated, we have to fall back on that. Is it coarsely equivalent to something that is finitely generated situation? And then 
if you can't relate it to a group at all, then you have to actually get into uh, what I'm going to call like the hands-on dirty work of the algebraic manipulations of those filtrations and stuff. So it's not all hope is lost there, but the result isn't as immediate there. Yes, but I, I, I don't understand you really. So my, my question was, was very simple. So okay. uh, if you associate a Kelly graph to a not finitely generated group, is it true what two Kelly graphs, graphs will be quasi isometric or a coarser equivalent or something like that? Um, I do want to say that all I'm trying, I guess I'm having a hard time parsing your question. Um, I know, or I can state that uh, Cayley graphs for, if you have different finite generating sets, the Cayley graphs are all quasi-isometric or coarsely equivalent. Yes, sure. Um, no problem with that. I don't know much about Cayley graphs for uh, infinitely generated groups, so I don't know that I can speak intelligently about it. So when you say that... Uh, mm, Z infinity is coarsely generated. Uh, which uh, uh, which Kelly graph uh, do, do you mean here? So that is a good point. Uh, so f initially, and I kind of glossed over it here. There's kind of a, a kind of diagram chasey kind of thing you can imagine here. So when I first say it, I mean it as the a subgraph of the Cayley graph of Z wreath Z which is a finitely generated Cayley graph. And oh, okay. It's about the subgraph. Mm -hmm. However, um, something I didn't talk about is uh, there's a permanence property for coarse embeddings. So it happens to be the case that Z infinity with that infinite generating set can be coarsely embedded, the definition I gave earlier, into that finitely generated Cayley graph from the wreath product. And that's enough to say that also that infinitely generated one is coarsely coherent, but it's not because of a statement about Cayley graphs. It's because there exists this coarse embedding, this map between them. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. okay. About that. So okay. it's technically true for both, but I glossed okay. over that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, friends. No problem. Sorry that that took me a minute. Uh, but that's really what I wanted to say. So thank you all for listening and. If you wanted to know where some of this stuff can appear, here is where. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Jonathan. Are there any further questions um, for the recorded portion of the talk? Did, did you mention the relation to that conjecture? Uh, at the very beginning, I just said that uh, the implication of being coarsely coherent is that this isomorphism exists between the homology groups with coefficients in a ring and the K-theory of group rings. So the algebraic K-theoretic version of the Borel conjecture uh, is true if you have a coarsely coherent group, but I am not making that argument uh, explicit in this work. That's a separate paper, if you will. Did you, is it able to easily say what the algebraic K-theory version of the Borel conjecture is? Uh, let me see if I can. I mean, I, I know the words. I want to see if I can switch. Can you guys still see my screen? Yeah. Let me see. Am I sharing my whole screen or that window? It's, it's the same thing you just were showing, but like, yeah. Okay. Now does it look different? <laughs> yes. Okay. So what I want to do. Let's see if this will let me. So I'm just going to add a blank page. And then I should be able to show you. So let's see if this works. So saying that this map alpha is an isomorphism is the algebraic k-theoretic version of this statement. So we understand homology pretty well, we like to think. 
but not so much. K-theory of plenty of things, but if you have a coarsely coherent group and you have that alpha is already injective, then alpha is surjective. We have this isomorphism between these two things. So that's the algebraic K-theoretic version, that we can understand the K-theory of these group rings if we understand the homology theory and we have this course invariant that I study. Okay, that's interesting. Anything else? Um, if not, I'd like to thank Jonathan again 